My name is Dr. Kenyon Williams. I'd like to welcome you here into the Minnesota State University Moorhead Percussion Studio, where today I want to go over the Minnesota 2020-21 All-State Audition excerpt for the mallet portion of your audition. Now, a little bit of word of advice. There are many things you can do that are going to really affect the sound and the technique and the tone of how you play the instrument, but none are going to have a bigger impact than your original mallet choice. So be very careful. When you're making a recording, get mallets that make your instrument and make the piece sound good. Oftentimes when I hear these auditions, I hear students select mallets that are simply too hard, and a marimba selection sounds far much more like a xylophone than like a marimba. In general, if you can notice, I'm playing actually Innovative Percussion 240s. It's not, this is basically kind of their medium slash medium soft mallet. An Innovative Percussion 300 might be better in some instances depending upon your instrument. But since I have a large resonant instrument here, I like to use these mallets just because they give me a little bit warmer, softer color, especially for the middle roll section of the excerpt we'll be playing for your Allstate audition. Now, one thing I've been emphasizing in all the videos I'm making for this is never, never, Never forget to practice without with your metronome. This is the single most important tool a percussionist owns. So make sure that you're practicing that metronome and you're practicing slowly. Don't go fast. Don't start at quarter note equals 108. Start at a much slower tempo and build yourself up. For example, if I were first learning this piece, I might start at around about 70. So I get the metronome going and I'm going to place that first bar nice and slow and I'm going to make sure I'm using a good down up stroke. What we call, if in marimba it's can call a piston stroke, it can be also be called a full stroke, where I go straight down and straight back up. I'm not going to play down into a thumpy sound on the bar, but I'm rather going to play coming off. Secondly, I'm going to make sure I'm striking the bar not in the dead center, but rather slightly off center. In the center, it gives me a little bit of a drier sound. Off center, it gives me a little warmer sound. You can hear if I go back and forth. A little bit warmer when I'm off the center. Also, when I'm playing on the accidentals, aka the black notes of a piano, I'm going to focus on playing again towards the middle of the bar. Normally, when I'm sight reading something or I'm working on something very quickly that I have to play very soon, I'll often play in the bottom end of the bars. But for an all-state audition or something where I'm really wanting to show my very best sound, my very best color, I'm going to focus upon moving quickly to the middle of the bar and getting established there. Again, the, not the very center, I should say, but towards the bottom edge, basically where the resonator uh, the bottom edge of the resonator is. It's a good place to strike. So again, if I were to start slow, quarter equals 70 here, then I have a nice, relaxed mezzo forte beginning. And notice how I'm focusing on getting good striking areas and getting a good sound. Now, as I got faster, and I'm bringing it now up to the actual marked tempo of 108, I would focus, as I got faster, again about five clicks a day, or five clicks a week, depending on how much practice time I'm able to put in, bumping that metronome up gradually. I would then now begin to obviously work on phrasing as well. Now, what is a phrase? On this piece, phrasing is very, very vital. Phrasing is what allows the music to sing and breathe. For example, if I play just the first two bars here with no phrasing, and I put the metronome on, so there's my pulse, one and and, and for and. Now, listen to what happens if I play this with no phrasing. Okay, I got the right notes, I got the right rhythms, but again, that's basic, that's fundamental. That's what everyone who's auditioning for Allstate should be doing. If I wanna really stick out in my recording, I need only play the right notes and the right rhythms. I need to play them musically with a good touch and a good tone. And I'm gonna add the phrasing element. So I'm, not, I'm gonna, I've drawn a little phrase here. And you can see I've actually written some phrase markings in my music. And in the phrase mark here, I'm gonna gradually get louder towards the middle. It's a two bar phrase and get softer towards the end. So here I go. Oh, that's much more interesting than what I played the first time. So, I'm going to play for you a little bit of this piece now, and I'm going to stop and then tell you what I did and the approach I took as I worked through it. So, follow along, and I'll stop as I go a little further in. Okay, now notice a couple things I did there, aside from botch one note at the very end. I put in a lot of phrasing. I'm trying to play musically. Um, notice, for example, the beginning to me is very mysterious. 
table. So I'm kind of not really meeting Metro Forte until the middle of my phrase. Then here I'm going to build. Oh, sorry. And there's that little boom that really launches me after my introduction into our main melody. So those first four bars are that little introduction that feeds into. Now we come into a problem. There's a staccato mark on that G. How do I play staccato on marimba? Well, the answer is you really can't. This instrument simply, there's no way to control the ring of the note. Well, there's no way to really control the ring of the note unless I physically did this and dampen the note. Some performers would say that's perfectly acceptable. Other performers would say, how about trying a dead stroke? In other words, and actually doing that. To me, that sound in this context of this piece right here really sticks out. It doesn't quite belong to everything else in the line, so I don't like that sound either. And it's simply too short of a rest for me to have time to go and get my finger down there quickly and accurately. I could try it, but I'm setting myself up for a lot of missed notes potentially, so I probably wouldn't do that either. Other marimbas would say, well, the best approach then is simply to grasp the mallet firmly, and when you strike, let the stroke be a solid, firm stroke. So instead of getting a legato stroke, like we may use on timpani, I'm going to use what we call like a staccato stroke, where I'm going to literally snap the bar in there. And that being that little oomph, that little power right there, I'm actually, subconsciously, and actually in slow motion, the mallet is hitting the bar, flattening, dampening the bar, because I'm grasping the mallet so tightly, so it dampens while it strikes and then comes off. Similar, if you will, to an ultra slow motion shot of a golf ball, where a golf ball is hit, and if you see it in slow motion, the golf ball actually wraps itself around the club before it launches. So if I'm grasping this club firmly, then the mallet literally wraps itself around the bar a little bit and then comes off in ultra slow motion. So that gives it a little bit more of a shorter ring time. In reality, it's so small as to be almost inaudible, especially on a recording for all stage. Unless you have incredibly high-end equipment, you're not going to be able to hear that very well. But I do encourage you to try to put it to use. Later on in the piece, when you look at the third line, or fourth line, excuse me, I see a definite spot where we're going to discuss some more staccato in a moment. So, for now, let's move on. One other, th and one very important part of this piece is this little lick right here. Again, notice that happens over and over in the piece. You want to make sure you're getting that B flat right in the middle, and I'm not getting a node, which many students are going to get, and I'm getting a nice little crescendo of the line because the music naturally moves up, which means my ear naturally wants to build. It doesn't want to do this. That doesn't sound right. Now you can see, notice too, I'm also not like crescendoing. I'm actually decrescendoing the little G when I come back. We call this the dynamic scale. As I go up in the instrument, my ear naturally hears the notes getting louder. As I go down in the range, my ear tends to naturally hear the notes getting softer. So when I play that whole message there in the second line, first measure, I immediately play that E flat a little bit stronger, a little bit more firmly. And that fits what I want to hear. I can also do that idea again with that uh, phrase idea where I'm going to crescendo to the middle, aka to the downbeat of the second bar, and decrescendo to the end of the bar. So when I play it all together, I have a little bit of a sense of flow as I go through it. All right, a very, another very tricky lick is that third line first measure. This run coming down is a little, is a bear. Okay, so, and also notice too, since it's the end of a phrase and since it's going down, I naturally hear it decrescendoing. However, you could make the argument that I would want to crescendo it so that I have a little bit more of a color change when I go to mezzo forte in the next bar. In other words, then immediately softer. Ah, that's not a bad choice either. And here's part of the glory of being a musician. It's your choice. There is no right answer. There's simply what sounds good and feels good to you. So I'd encourage you to experiment. Try the phrase. Try inserting things that sound musical, that make the music more than simply this. That's boring. and Nobody really wants to hear that. Now, if we're moving on here in the third line, look at the little roll section here. The thing the judges are going to be listening for here is can you connect the rolls without breaking? In other words, does it sound smooth without the rolls changing speed as I move from note to note? Or do I break and pause? So a good roll section here. A little break here because there's a break in the phrase.
Whereas a bad version of that would be. Where I'm constantly changing roll speeds. I'm even getting the roll rhythms wrong. And I'm letting myself change when I want to have rather a continuous roll. Now I may get the roll gradually faster or slow it down, but I'm doing that within the context of the whole phrase, not just note for note. So be very careful about that. A good way to practice this is simply practicing moving above the notes like this without playing. Can I do this without breaking the roll? Then try doing the sixteenths. Etc. Etc. Finally, after I can do that smoothly, try it fast as 16. Okay. Then I simply do it out of the context of tempo. So I'm thinking no 16s now, just a single stroke roll. Break. Notice as I go up, right hand should get there first. As I go down, for example, from the D flat down to the C, left hand should get there first. Then down to the B flat, left hand, left hand again. Otherwise, if my right hand is trying to get ahead of it, I'm probably going to have something that goes like this. And I'm going to have all these little hiccup and gaps. So make sure the proper hand motion allows for the smoothest roll flow possible. When I move into the fourth line, notice here, again, I'm going back for my mysterious theme. So here, I'm going to try something and tell me if you like it. Here we go. Are you ready? Ah, notice those little dead strokes I did right there. To give a staccato sound. Now, to be honest, some judges may like that. Some judges may not like it. Some judges might like the idea of, well, there is time here, maybe to do an actual finger dampening to get a really staccato sound. That's hard, but it is possible. Personally, um, some of judges too also might just say, just use the stronger snack, uh, snap attack we talked about earlier to get a little bit more of a snap. So if I go from a legato, snap, snap, which is going to give me a little bit of a pop to the sound. But I do want to make sure whatever else happens, those do notes do sound slightly different than every other note that I played in that line. Again, you get to decide as the performer. Now, notice after I finish that lick, I begin at the end of the fourth line. Now, again, I'm going to keep my phrasing I've been using, and I'm going to be, keep it mysterious. Here I go. Three, four. And then I go on from there. So notice that building body. Ba da, ba ba, boom, and that explosion out the end is going to give me that real sense of musical flow and line that's going to make me stand out among the others. Finally, as I finish the piece, I want to finish nice and strong. Notice we we ended forte in the last line; it stays forte for the last line with a little bit, and I would insert just a little bit of a crescendo, especially as I get to the very end. So our very last line then now becomes. Okay, nice and strong, nice and firm, and again, phrasing the beginning of two measures, like we did the beginning. But right there, I like the lead up right there. Now I could go again. No, we know the dead stroke doesn't work there. It sounds terrible. I could go and try that, but again, the problem with that is my F sharp is still ringing. So it doesn't really work there. But I'm setting myself up <laughs> for all kinds of crazy sounds and noises. So again, you have to be practical. The marimba simply doesn't really play staccato. You can find techniques, and I've, I mentioned three of them here, that give you ideas for how to play them. But nevertheless, it mostly comes down to simply playing the note with that maybe a little bit more attack, a little bit stronger sound that's going to make it pop out of the texture just a little bit. All right. I hope you found this masterclass of marimba helpful. Take care and good luck in your own audition.